There is nothing in the world I'd rather do than what I do. How do we do 10 episodes of this extinct animal show? We got our cameras, we got out there, and we didn't really know what we were making. It wasn't like sending guys to stay at a Hilton, but it was getting guys into the middle of nowhere and surviving. Look at that unusual jaw morphology. That is something that's never been seen in a Cayman anywhere on Earth. Let's go look for animals that are deemed extinct. People don't really know when something's gone forever. It's a big world, there's lots of places to hide. Yeah, let's do that. That's like right up my alley. Nothing's gonna happen quickly, nothing's gonna happen efficiently, and we're theoretically working on timetables that should be really immediate. It's awesome to see these places, but a lot of times it can be sad. You do see what humanity is doing to the planet. We'll go looking for these animals, and the reality is they're gone because we killed them. This is the show I wanna do. This is the message I wanna give out. Here's how I wanna do it. I don't wanna boss, I wanna do it myself and I'm just going to keep going down this road. Forrest is an absolute nutcase lunatic. Forrest is great. He's a fun guy. I consider him to be one of my closest friends in the world. I've only known him for, you know, two and a half, three years now. But... Yes! Yes! <laughs> Yes! It's really hard for me to say what the first time that I had like a major impactful moment knowing that my life would be about conservation was. One thing that comes to mind is when I was a little boy, I was in the Zambezi River Delta of Zimbabwe. My grandfather, who was a wonderful bushman, took me fishing and down came this young bull elephant 15, 20 feet away and my grandpa just said, don't move or you're dead. We just had this magical 40 or 45 minutes where the elephant was knew we were there and just kind of realized we weren't a threat to him and he just took his last drink, turned around and walked away and it was just the most like, peaceful interaction and I was like, this is, this is what I want to do my whole life. I want to be close to animals like this forever. Look at how he's curled up. He's hissing at me, he wants to have a go. He's just enormous. This is an animal I've wanted to see my entire life. And you know, at first impression, I was like, he seems like a nice kid. He was like, yeah, you know, just another host. And then I remember distinctly in Taiwan, we had that like stepbrother moment where him and I were like joking around. And all of a sudden we looked at each other and we were like, do we, do we just become best friends? Like, you know. Great attitude on life. Love his philosophy, what he's done with animals and wildlife and what he wants to do with animals and wildlife. My grandfather was just a businessman in Southern Africa. He wasn't like a scientist, but he was a wonderful explorer and adventurer and had the passion. But he had a keen eye for the unusual and adventure. And when he was on an expedition into the Comores, he found this bizarre looking fish sitting on a table at a fish market and said, this is not right. And he had that fish frozen and flown down to Salisbury. And there it was figured out that it was one of the first ever specimens, whole specimens of a non-rotten coelacanth, a fish believed extinct for 666 million years. And he actually found that in a fish market. It's kind of a legacy that I've attempted to live up to. So I'd come up with this idea for this show called Extinct or Alive. It was the first show that I'd ever created that I was actually gonna go pitch to networks. And I got hooked up by my agent. He had met Forrest because he was on Naked and Afraid and I think a couple people were interested in him because he came off like a real dickhead on that show. Uh, he was really arrogant and just kind of had this thing about him. First time I've actually paid attention to what I look like. I could see my hair is standing straight up like Einstein. I came home from a biological job. I'd been on the California Channel Islands, probably about three month contract. Tired, covered head to toe in dirt, miserable. Plopped down on the couch. My girlfriend, who's now my wife, goes, look at this stupid show on TV. Go, what is that? Goes, it's called Naked and Afraid. I was like, what, what the hell's Naked and Afraid? Is it's this really dumb thing where these two people meet for the first time naked on camera and then they just try and survive for 21 days. And she's like, you should just do it. It'd be a fun adventure for you, you know? Get out of the monotony of counting ants of the Channel Islands or whatever. I sent a super cocky email to the production company. Never filled out a casting application. Just this cocky email going, hey, seen your show. Those people suck. I'm better. So I did Naked and Afraid. I was the highest rated survivalist in the show's history. It was funny because I remember the producers being like, well, well, can't you just like struggle a little bit? Like, just just tell us how hard it is. I'm like, this isn't hard. Like, this is a fucking vacation. Like, I just ate 230 oysters for lunch. Like, do you know how much that would cost me in Santa Barbara? Like, this is great. People started reaching out to me to learn about wildlife stuff that was going on all over the world where I had worked. And that was my window of opportunity. And then I started getting approached to do television shows. And then it's like, hey, do you want to go look for Bigfoot? No. Do you want to go down to the Amazon and search for UFOs? 
No, like I'll go to the Amazon, I'm not looking for UFOs. You know, just all the time on Yahoo News, I would just see like little articles here and there, like extinct animal found, extinct animal found. I just kind of just all came together. Like what if we just went out and looked? And we came up with this crazy idea, extinct or alive. Let's go look for animals that are deemed extinct. People don't really know when something's gone forever. It's a big world, there's lots of places to hide. Yeah, let's do that. That's like right up my alley. It's passionate about wildlife, passionate about animals. I can talk about conservation. We created this pitch and it took us two years to get a maybe, another year to get a pilot, another year to get a series, and you know, here we are. Multiple seasons later, Shark Week specials later, everything else. Patrick, one of the creators of the project, gave me the lowdown on the idea of the show. It sounded exciting, logistically difficult, but that's what I do. That's what, you know, why people hire me. Basically, it was getting guys into the middle of nowhere and surviving, trying to find something that may or may not exist. I took a lot of no's. <laughs> we, we went into a lot of production companies that just said no. And I mean, I, I think we went to every single one in Los Angeles. And then Patrick and I got on a plane and went to New York and I walked into Hot Snakes Media and met with a man named Eric Evangelista who owns that company and said, here's our idea. And he said, yeah, let's give it a shot. And I will forever be grateful for him for believing in us. And when our pilot came out, that year I believe the most successful thing to run during Monster Week. It, it, I think it was the first time, if I remember correctly, that anything had beaten Jeremy Wade's River Monsters. So everybody was super excited. So we were, I, you know, we were over the moon. And then it took an additional year for them to pick it up as a series. So back to relentless daily conversations. This is the show I want to do. This is the message I want to give out. Here's how I want to do it. I don't want a boss. I want to do it myself. And I'm just going to keep going down this road. Christmas Eve, and I get an email that says, I believe it was like six words. It said, congratulations, you have yourselves a series. That was it. From, from a guy who I love, by the way, at the network. And that was all the email said, and it was the best Christmas gift I had ever been given. <laughs> The first episode that we shot for the series was one of the most challenging ones, the search for the Formosan clouded leopard in Taiwan. In order to look for the clouded leopard, we had to get to basically the top of this mountain and we hired porters to take us from the base and carry all the stuff up to the top of this mountain. And of course, when we get there, the porters are very drunk and they're you know not able to carry. So we ended up having to carry a lot of our own gear. But then when we went halfway up the hill, we find out that the poachers have guns and they've been hunting. And of course, Forrest is horrified and, and angry. You know, I think in the entire time I've worked with Forrest, that was one of the angry I've ever seen him. I'm not gonna let this go run around with a gun and shoot stuff. I can tell you that right now. Like I, I will absolutely stop him physically. They had a gun and they weren't supposed to and they were super drunk and I like grabbed it and got physical and screamed at him. And we didn't find the animal, right? We're still looking for an extinct animal. So you spend six years developing this thing to say, we're gonna go do this thing that's impossible to accomplish, find an extinct animal. And of course you're expected to deliver on something that nobody else in the universe can deliver on. And we didn't. But we weren't deflated, you know, we weren't defeated. We told a wonderful story, we learned about conservation, we showed the problem with poaching firsthand, with me losing my cool. I think my thought of how this show was gonna be when it was just an idea and a pilot to what it's become has definitely changed because I trust Forrest so much. You know, that said, that the job of the producer in the field is to be taking all this information in and helping guide him. Hey, I think that thing we did yesterday, this is the context you're gonna need and just, you know, the way that Forrest talks through scenes and things like that. You know, he's really good at looking for the animals and he does think like a producer now. You can say what you want about him because I like to make fun of him a lot just for because it's easy. He's sending trail cameras ahead to people months in advance, like before we even know if we're picked up for another season, just to try and get as much intel as he can. That's come a long way. Season one, it was, we got our cameras, we got out there, and we didn't really know what we were making, but over time, it just sort of progressed into a certain style where, you know, which cameras to use for certain things and which shots to get, and we, you know, we all kind of have these shot lists in our head that like, we need this, 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 and this. We started shooting, and then we would see the episodes and kind of pick apart what we liked, what we didn't like. So what can we do to make it you know, look even better. Our show is not necessarily about the destination, it's about the journey. And the journey is to show you this incredible ecosystem that does still exist and the things that are still worth saving. And so I felt very happy that we'd done that. And then we continued to do it with that model in mind. So we're just gonna tell the story. It's gonna be about the journey until the very last episode of the first season. Look, look, look. Oh my God. 
when you're deciding how do we do 10 episodes of this extinct animal show, it's sort of a balance of some that maybe aren't as exciting, but you think you have a pretty good chance of finding it, and then some episodes where there's a great story, but you think there's essentially no chance. And so that was the Zanzibar leopard. The odds of finding the extinct leopard that has been gone for 25 years are infinitely small. I'm just sitting on the back of a bus checking trail camera footage, so nobody's rolling a camera, of course, because why would you be? He knew better than to do that. I was always really tough with him. I would not let him see trail cam footage before I got to look at it. So I don't want Forrest to see something when the camera's not there to capture, because he's looking at his computer and there's not a camera and all of a sudden something happens, it's not caught. Cut to the night we're on our way back from the national park, Forrest is in the back. He's very quiet, I didn't know what he was doing back there, but I just saw him on his computer. Sure enough, I get to the next one, like sleepy-eyed, and my I'm just like, rewind, click, rewind, click and forest starts screeching. You know, it sounds like someone stepped on a bird in the back of the, in the back of the bus. I'm like annoyed, it's late. I'm like, what is he doing? He's like, stop the bus, stop the bus. I'm like, oh God. And then he's just looking and his eyes are tearing up. I'm like, pull over, pull over, oh my God, oh my God. Holy fuck, you know, I start screaming in the bus. I, you know, you just immediately get chills, I'm like, I hope this isn't that he found some rare squirrel. Like, I hope this is a very large spotted cat. And I'm like, you know, holding a camera, I'm just like click and just started pointing it, you know, just covering a wide just to see, you know, like what is going on? And he's literally like, ah, he's like, I can't believe it. And we're all like, Forrest, like calm down. And like, what are you talking about? I'm like, look at this. And I flip the computer around, the bus screeches to a halt like mid road. The driver doesn't know what's going on. You know what I mean? It was just calamity. And sure enough, we had footage of an animal that the world hadn't seen in 25 years. There's this big, healthy, fat leopard walking through the trail camera that we had just kind of left up. That was my Oscar, right? That was the my entire life's work coming to fruition in a two second clip on a laptop in the back of a bus. That was a huge moment for everybody. You know, we all were very emotional, especially Forrest, because it's, you know, it's his life. It's what he's dedicated his entire life to doing. It's what his grandfather did. To know that like everything you stand for and work for is worth it because you've you've done what literally everybody has told you is impossible is powerful and not just on an individual level like for me but on a global level for conservation and for the species to bring to light this amazing thing that the world had given up on and to, resources can be released to help this creature and exposure is coming for it and conservation efforts are going to go into place we rewrote natural history some of the areas that these animals are, are dangerous. And what that means is for a TV production, they're uninsurable. Forrest really had this hair about this Rio Epiporus came in uh, in the Amazon in an area that outsiders really hadn't been in a long time. In fact, the last group that went was a group of British journalists. I mean, they were kidnapped and held for ransom. When Forrest told me what he wanted to do, great. And when he told me where he wanted to do it, I was saying, no, you're not going into the area where the rebels and drug runners are hiding. If we went down there and anything happened, uh, myself and my partner were probably gonna go to jail or prison. <laughs> and so then it becomes a calculated risk and it becomes a lot of phone calls with Forrest and hearing the convincing and sort of just assessing whether or not you wanna do it. They flew into Bogota, but then from Bogota, they had to drive to a remote airfield, take a private plane to a more remote part of Colombia, where they then hiked to the river where they got on little boats and went up the river. I mean, logistically it was very difficult. We ended up finding a Colombian fixer who had never been to the area. And we said, if he can do a scout trip and he tells us that he's confident that the crew's not gonna get kidnapped, if we brought a huge film production, we would be potentially in trouble. So we made the decision to send a really, really small crew. So I had intel from a local Colombian scientist named Sergio Riena who, who said this is where to go, right? So we started seeing splashes and I believed it was the Rio Apoporus Cayman, but I didn't have like the proof for it because a splash is a splash. Maybe two nights before we called it, we caught one and we snuck up on it just right. We figured out the boat angle, the approach. Sure enough, sitting on my lap 
was this six foot long animal that the world said didn't exist. This is the most incredible thing I have ever done. This is the most incredible experience. This was a thriving population of these creatures that existed because human impact hadn't been in that region. It's a little scary to not have a producer there, to basically have an audio and two cameras and forest. If they get down there, it goes well and they find it, we can figure out a way to make this sort of a different type of episode. As we got into post on that episode, you felt it. It was a smaller crew and that they were running and gunning and, and the footage was just inherently more disjointed and a, much more difficult to put together. They found, they came in and forest wrestled an and you know, it ended up being good stuff. And just like that, the Rio Apoporus came and is no longer extinct! <laughs> so when the show ends, the mission does not. In fact, it kind of just begins. Well, let's take the Fernandine Island tortoise. We raised a lot of money, independent from the network, independent from my own pocket, just people that saw the show or saw the headlines and said, oh my God, this is incredible. This is the most hope-inspiring story of conservation I've ever heard. Look at this! <laughs> <laughs> well, we funnel money through, through various organizations to local scientists and governing conservation bodies, and I act as a catalyst. I find the animal or expose the habitat, and that creates this big excitement and emotion and support for this thing, and now they're super motivated to apply those resources to conservation. So it's, it's a real win-win for absolutely everybody involved. The angriest I've ever seen Forrest or personally been on the shoots is after a discovery. Like nothing's gonna happen quickly, nothing's gonna happen efficiently, and we're theoretically working on timetables that should be really immediate. If you're thinking about an animal that may be the last one of its species, or hopefully one of the last two or three so that they could breed, you wanna things to happen really quickly so that breeding efforts could be made or new regulations could be put in place to protect that habitat. This is big stuff, you know, this is major international wildlife conservation and we work with big wildlife conservation governing bodies to make sure that laws and regulations are in place because when something's extinct there's no law. You can't say it's illegal to kill this thing that doesn't exist. It's like me telling you it's illegal to shoot an alien, right? It doesn't exist. So once we actually uncover that these species are there, then we, uh, we actually help put legislation in place to protect them. There is nothing in the world I'd rather do than what I do. It might have taken longer, it might have been more of a struggle and been harder, but it resulted in what I ultimately wanted to do. You know, from season one to season two, we learned a lot and we got better at procuring intel before we went into the field. And that's why I think we had a higher success rate. We really had one big discovery in season one. I think we had four or five in season two. Our expeditions are the culmination of years of research, months of planning, and weeks in the field. Right now I have a list of about 50 different animals that are in my top 50 of animals to search for. Forest's goal was always to find extinct animals, but as a producer, you know, I, I've come to trust the process that if we have some piece of information, some glimmer of hope, some villagers that say, I swear to God, this thing's here, it's better to go find an animal and then figure out how to craft it in post than chasing some great story where you're not gonna find it. The show is progressing, we're, we're starting to make a name for ourselves, and like, I think we're beginning to inspire kids below us. You know, I get messages from parents and kids that are like, oh, I, you know, you see you on the TV doing the drone stuff, you got any advice? Or get out there, get experience, get your hands dirty, learn how to do it step by step. There is no easy to go from A to Z. You really need to go through the steps to learn how to do it correctly. Here we go. <laughs> this is our pen? Yeah. Okay. 2,000 species are deemed extinct every single year. I'm not going to stop looking for animals that are wrongfully deemed extinct. It's up to us to inspire the next generation to care about these things. And the best way that I know how to do it is on television. In doing that, it's not just entertainment, but sincere education and, and real wildlife work. And I'm just getting started. <laughs>